Texas. There's a place for everyone here and we're happy that you're with us. If you're visiting us for the first time today, we'd love for you guys to text the word guest to the number below because we want to connect with you. Also, if you haven't yet, be sure to stop by our Welcome Center or you can join us right here in the auditorium following either service at our welcome party in the East Alcove. You would have also received a welcome card and we ask that you fill that out and either hand it in with the volunteer from guest services or you can drop it in the giving boxes that are in the back of the room. We'd like to know that you were here and it's a way for us to follow up with you and learn about your experience. We recently launched Love Our City. This churchwide all ages volunteer event is taking place on March 2nd, but signups are happening now. We're partnering with 10 different local organizations that have been doing incredible work throughout Tucson and making a difference in the lives of our homeless, refugees, children, and families. There's an opportunity for everyone to actively participate in this event. And you can find out all the details on the main page of our website under current events. Also, after either service today, our outreach leaders will be on the plaza to answer questions and get you signed up. And we can't wait to serve with you. Thank you for being with us this morning. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we hope you have a great Sunday with us.
Let's sing that as a prayer. Show me your ways. Show me your ways. Show me your ways. Jesus, show me your ways. Show me your ways. Show me. Asking in the Father's name, reveal your heart to me. I want to bear the fruit that stays, so come abide in Why don't you guys take a moment to turn and greet one another? Say good morning. Hi. Then go ahead and grab a seat when you're done for just a moment. I said this last hour, I'm going to say it again. You guys should give yourselves a hand. You are the two Sonins who aren't scared of rain. Yes. Right? It's a thing when you live in the desert. You're like, it rains, we can't drive but 10 miles under the speed limit and we're all going to die from the water. We don't know what to do. And you're courageous and you made it and it's so good to see you guys. I'm glad that you guys are here. It's nice to be with you this morning. Is that all of our middle schoolers over there? Can we just take a moment to recognize our students for a second? We love you guys. You may not know this, but our middle schoolers all join us once a month for worship together just to know that they're part of the larger church and that the larger church is a part of them and it's a beautiful thing to have you guys here. We love you. It's awesome to have you in the room with us. Um, today, today uh, is a different kind of day and here's why. We've been in the middle of this series called uh, Don't Get on the Ride and we're just gonna pause it for just today. And the reason why is because there's this really significant event that is coming up in March called Love Our City, where we're going to be partnering as an entire church with 10 other agencies, ministries, like, you know, people out in our community that are doing an amazing job trying to love people right where they are, and we want to come alongside and do the same thing. And I just want to say thank you to the many of you that have already signed up. Uh, This morning when I first started talking, it was like 270 people had already signed up. And now after last service, it's even more than that. I don't even know the number. So that's a really big deal. Thank you guys for showing up in an amazing way. It's a big deal. Yeah. And keep going. If you, if you haven't jumped in on this, remember, we're shooting for like 430 people, not because we set a lofty goal, but because the agencies are like, man, this would be so good if we could have this many people. And this is what we've got set up and we want to show up to love them well. Uh, and so, so this morning, we're going to pause in that normal series that we were doing just for today. Next week, I'll, I'll kick us right back off into it uh, and, and be teaching that next week. But today is all about this, this idea of love our city. Because here's what could happen. We could all just go step into all the various places in our community, do a great job, you know, do some kind things, love some people, and call it good. But there's really a deeper heart in terms of who we are as a church and what that means and why we're after it. And so this morning is an opportunity to unify around that and to share common heart, common goal as we go to step into this larger thing. And that's really what this is going to be all about. And Glenn's going to come lead us out with that in just a moment. So I'm glad you're here. And if you've never heard about it before, I'm glad you're here. You're in good company. Uh, And this morning will be a great morning. You know, for those of us uh, that give, we're a church, uh, and you know this, we're a church that is all about loving people into the acceptance and freedom of Jesus Christ. And so in the way that we give of our finances is about advancing that and seeing uh, how God can continue to use this unique expression that is Casas Church to love the people around us and in this place in, in a just really profound type of way. And so I just love what's happening there. You know, if you've never given before, you, I'd encourage you to be a part of it and, and keep helping us sustain this and love this thing forward and seeing what God's going to do. And so there's just different ways that you can do that. You can actually do that online, which is really easy for some of us. Others, maybe you want to give just here in the room and there's envelopes and the seat backs, I believe. And if there's not, uh, you can find those and near every door is a box and you can just drop that on your way out or you can mail in But I just think God's been doing an extraordinary thing through our church. I know I say this a lot and people are like, we know, right? We hear you. But I really do. I think God's been doing an extraordinary thing through our church and loving people in a really unique way. And I'm excited for what he's going to continue to do in this season of time. I'd love it if you bow your heads with me and then we'll continue on in our service uh, here today. God, we love you. 
We do, Lord. We love you so much. We thank you for the rain. We thank you that you watered the desert. And I just, I pray, Lord, in the same way that you just be a refreshment to our souls and our spirits here today. And I know there's probably some people in this room that need that. God, I know there's probably some people in this room that walked in here today feeling uh, just a little down and out or just maybe a little dry in whatever that might mean, Lord. And I just pray refreshment for their spirit. I pray that each of us right here and right now would know that you're as close to us as you could possibly be. And I pray that we wouldn't just know it in our brains, we'd know it in our hearts, Father, this morning. God, as we seek to just be a church that loves people well, whether in this room or in the larger community around us, we ask for your wisdom to guide us. We ask for your courage to step into the moments that need to be. We ask for our eyes to be opened, for you to bring people along. And Lord, as we just continue to try to use our finances and steward those things in good ways, I just pray that you give us wisdom there too. Do great things, God, and just help us to to continue to step into the moments you have for us. We're so excited to be your church here this morning. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, if you would please stand and let's continue in worship with one another. I've searched the world
We're not your trophy children you abandon when we roam. Your mercy's not a favor, and your presence is in rust. Oh no, our God is love. The cross was not a vehicle for you to find the care. When we look upon your character, your grace was always there. Acceptance not withheld from us, no need to measure up. Oh no, our God is love. His arms are
God, we love you and we thank you that you're a God of love, that you are love, Father. So our prayer for today and our prayer for our church is that those around us will experience that, that they will see that love in us. And God, as we serve this coming March, they will know that. They'll be pointed back to a God that loves them so fiercely and so deeply. God, let us be that church. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Well, I want to um, <clears throat> I want to talk about uh, May second, and I, were, and I really want to kind of just set a lens for it. There, oops. And it's the what's that? March second. What did I say? You know, at Christmas I said August. <clears throat> Whatever other wiser people have said, make sure you. <laughs> We're going to look at a better lens for this. <laughs> you ever tried to work something and it's just not working? <clears throat> so I want to use that as an illustration this morning. <laughs> um, I, uh, a week or so ago, I was trying to load a bunch of uh, water bottles in the back of my, uh, I've got this old Cherokee in an ice chest. And I dropped one on the ground. And every time I went to pick that one up, I dropped another one. And it just, like, it was like a little circus as I was trying to do all of this. And a friend of mine, John, I'm trying to see if John is here right now. He may be. He was there and he's like, can I help you? And I'm like, oh, no, no, I've got this. Plunk, plunk. I was like, you know, I could use some help right now. <clears throat> and he helped me out. And the second he did, I realized... That felt so good. Like I was actually getting really frustrated in that moment as I couldn't, you know, work in it and it just wouldn't work. And there's something about at times where uh, someone can do something that maybe is simple, really tangible, uh, that just cares a little bit, that actually makes a difference. Ever, ever have someone do that for you? Ever have a moment where, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's... Um, an issue uh, with a prescription and you're at the pharmacy and it's just like, oh my gosh, this is just becoming maddening. And then there's someone like on the other side of the counter that's like, you know, let me help you with that. Let me, right? And they get into a computer and they do a little thing and you're just like, oh, thank you, right? Or you're working with the insurance company yourself and you work and you know, and there's somebody on the other line and they do something that's just, it's just simple and tangible and kind, and it just makes a difference, right? And you can feel it where it hits you on a deeper level at times. Like it, it can change your perspective on an entire day. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because there's something about uh, what you see with Jesus that is so similar. There, there was a kind of way that he interacted with people oftentimes that was, he just loved them with a kind of simple, tangible care that just, it, like it just had this profound way of making a difference. And as human beings, there's just so many moments where um, like we need that. And when I think about Jesus, again, like there was, he had such traction to his ministry, didn't he? I, I mean, like the, he was just like unstoppable. Yet on the other hand, you think about it, like there were people that resisted what he did and they felt like he was, you know, uh, going too far and they wanted to push back. And yet, like he was able to continue going forward. And I think one of the reasons why uh, Jesus had such great traction in what he did was because of the way he would just love people with a simple, tangible kind of love. And when we think about March 2nd, okay, I got it right? March 2nd, thank you, yeah. I want, us to, I want us to think about that. Like when we think about love our city, 
that, that Christ gives us like a way or a lens to think about it that I think is so important. And so this morning, what I want to do, um, and we thought we'd take a break from our series just to focus on this. Um, I, I want to look at a moment where you just see Jesus uh, do this. There's this moment when he's in Jerusalem. Uh, we're going to be in, by the way, we're going to be in the book of John, the gospel of John chapter five. If you uh, want to turn there, we're going to unpack that just a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Jesus, just in an ordinary day, he is traveling through Jerusalem. And what we learn is he goes by this pool uh, that was called Bethesda. It's an Aramaic uh, uh, name. And the thing that is important about this pool at Bethesda is it would, there was something going on uh, geologically or something that every once in a while it would stir or bubble. And people had this belief and their belief was that when that, when those waters were stirring or bubbling, if you could get into the water while it was still stirring or bubbling, it had like these remarkable healing powers. They believed, they believed that like, if you could just get in there, especially if you were the first person in that, if you were crippled or suffering from some sort of ailment or disease um, or injury, even like it had these healing powers. And so people would um, sit outside uh, or on the edge of this pool waiting for it to stir or bubble so that they could jump in. And Jesus is is walking by this uh, area and he sees this man that is crippled. And so we pick up the story there. And I want you to, I want you to watch how this unfolds in what Jesus does. So John chapter five, starting in verse five, it says this, uh, one who was there uh, had been an invalid for 38 years. Um, probably an injury, maybe not. He may have been born uh, with this. We don't know for sure, but it says this. When Jesus saw him uh, lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? And this guy doesn't know who Jesus is, right? And this guy, you know, there's some guy says, do you want to get well? And immediately this guy goes into, well, you know, of course I do, but here, here's my struggle. I'm trying to work this thing because of course he's there at the pool at Bethesda because like if, you know, when the water stir, if I can get in the waters while they're still stirring, like, you know, and especially if I'm the first one, maybe I can be healed of this ailment that keeps me from being able uh, to walk. And so he responds in this way. Look at verse seven. Sir, the invalid rep- replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Um, And what you see is this guy, he's doing his best, right? He can't walk. He's uh, like some sort of of injury or something that he was born with. And his problem is um, that he needs to be able to get up and walk at least a few steps to get into the pool. But the reason he needs to get into the pool is because he can't walk. But if he could walk, he could get into the pool. But of course, if he could walk, he wouldn't need to get into the pool. Right? And it's just like, he's like working this thing. That's like, Bruh. like his, his problem is that his problem keeps him from solving the problem, right? It just, and that's what he's going through uh, in this whole thing. And, and it's like, Jesus sees this. And, and then it turns into this um, uh, amazing miracle. But on another sense, it's also so tangible. Right and so caring, uh, we look uh, at verse nine. Look at verse, or I'm sorry, verse eight. Look at verse eight. Then Jesus said to him, "Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Pick that, you know, get your get your yoga mat up. You're done, man. We're the, the, the whole different day for you, right? At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. And right, it just at a surface level here, I want you to think about the change that Jesus creates in this man's life. He has spent maybe the last 38 years like struggling, like, okay, if I could just get up, if I could just move enough to get into that pool when it stirs, right? And he's been working this thing, but he can't. He can't like either stop stirring or there's someone else that gets in front of him or in his way or gets into it first. And he's been trying this thing and Jesus sees it and goes, I I can do something about this because I'm Jesus. We don't need the pool at Bethesda in this thing. I can take care of this. And he does. And I think about this. This man, right, because of what he suffered, um, there'd be no work for him, no job, no employment. Um, And in this culture, to be crippled in this way, this meant like he'd never get married. He'd never have children, never have a family of his own. There would be festivals, there'd be gatherings, there'd be all of these different things And that because of his condition, 
he would be seen as like less than. Because of his condition, like there'd be something unspiritual, unpure about him. And so there'd be all of these different festivals and gatherings and community things that he would be only on the periphery of, that he wouldn't get to be a part of until this day, right? Because on this day, Jesus comes along and, and and at this first level, there's this amazing thing that we just see. Here's a man who can't walk and now he can't, right? That change alone, right there, like what an amazing day it would be for this man. But now all of a sudden it opens him up to like, he can get a job now. He can travel around. Like, you know, think about in the first century, like, you know, there weren't photographs, there weren't videos, there weren't like, he is stuck in a place in his whole world. Everything he gets to see and experience it was probably right there. And occasionally maybe there was someone that would pick him up and carry him from one place to another in this. Other than that, that was his world. And now all of a sudden, like the world is open to this guy in a way he's never experienced. And you know, oftentimes when someone, when Jesus loved someone in this way, did minister to them in some way, like you see this immediate physical thing that, that is just, it's glorious and we love it, right? Same thing happens with us. There's moments where maybe someone helped you in some way. Maybe there's something that God did in your life. Maybe there was a miracle God did in your life. And there's this first level of just what a glorious, beautiful thing it is. But I want you to think about that next level down. Because there's something about just this simple, tangible, caring love that Jesus does in this moment that would just have this ongoing effect. You know, suddenly the possibility of him having a family, of being married is on the table again. The possibility of building friendships that maybe weren't really practical or possible before suddenly become a part of this, right? What we miss is that this is a man, like he would have lived his life in a way where so many people would have laid eyes on him, but never really saw him. And maybe now that begins to change. And the reason I say this is because there's a moment in here, which I think is one of the more poignant moments in this story, that if, if you see it, like it, it hits you. Um, go back to verse seven. Look at this. These four words out of verse seven, when he responds to Jesus, he says, I have no one. That I think is the deeper truth of what this guy was faced with. I have no one. I got here and I'm working it. I'm trying to like, I'm, I'm at the place where I think is my best shot of getting past or over or being healed in this thing. And I'm struggling. I'm trying to get in that pool when I can, but you know, who knows how often it would bubble or stir or whatever. And because of his condition, it made it all, like he's working it, but it's not working. And part of what's not working is that it's like, I have no one, he says. It's kind of like he's saying, no one sees me. But part of that begins to change in this, right? Because now in this moment, it's not just a job, right? It opens him up to all these other possibilities. I think, I I, I can't imagine how this man would live 38 years in this condition, being viewed the way he would have been viewed spiritually and not wonder constantly, why does God not love me? Why, does, why doesn't God care about me? Like what, like, what is it about me that God would look at me and go, eh, because I've got no one, right? But Jesus sees him. Jesus sees him. And the, and the greater miracle here is the love that this man must have experienced in this moment. Like all of a sudden, like the idea that maybe he does matter to God. Maybe all of a sudden God sees me in a way that 
that, that makes me think of myself in a whole new way. Like there's something, re- do you see how beautiful this is, right? There's this cascading effect of this simple, tangible, caring kind of love that just cascades into, some, into this guy's life. And, it just, and you can just see how it will play out over and over again. And what I want you to see here is like, this is just how Jesus did things, right? He, Jesus sees him. And Jesus loved people again and again and again in this way. It's as, Jesus, it's as if Jesus comes up and just says, like, I see you. I, like, I understand what's going on in this. And I don't want us to miss this. And one of the things about this story, and the reason I picked this, this story this morning, is because we get this kind of contrast with this. So picture this man. He's healed. The world is his oyster. He's got his little yoga mat. And it's just like, where am I going next, right? And you know where he decides to go next? It's the place that maybe a lot of us would go. Like, it's just like, I've been healed. God was in this. You know, I'm going I'm, I'm to go celebrate this. It, and it would be the equivalent of church for him, right? I'm going to go to the temple area. I'm going to go where the religious leaders are. I'm going to talk to my pastor about this. I'm going to talk to the small group leader, you know, my Bible study teacher. I'm, I'm going to go share this because this is like this is awesome right this is and that's where he goes right now of course there's this little issue with that mat right because uh we'll find out we'll read the text here in a second uh he's carrying a mat and that's a big no-no because it's the sabbath right and the sabbath uh, um Honoring the Sabbath and circumcision were two of the most important moral, holy issues there were at this day. Like you, you, if between circumcision and the, and honoring the Sabbath, like there was so much about those. You did not mess with those. And on the Sabbath, to pick up your mat and do that kind of work. That was a total violation. So uh, look what happens uh, here. Look at verse nine. It says, uh, the day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders, so he goes to the Jewish leaders, the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat, right? And you can say, yeah, I know, but look at this. I can walk, I can dance. Yeah, but you're holding a mat, right? And all of a sudden, it's like what they're, do you see what they're looking at in this moment? It's they're like, whoa, wait a minute. This is like, do you see us carrying a mat? We're not carrying our mat, right? You know, and what are you? And it's just this thing where all of a sudden, like where they've been drawn, they've been pulled in this certain direction about what matters in this moment. That's a great question, isn't it? What matters in this moment? And for them, it's like, man, we've got some stuff that's really important. There's some moral things here that are really important. There's some beliefs. There's some mat carrying kinds of rules that are really important. And you're not following them. And that's where this discussion needs to go, right? Imagine, imagine for a moment that God did something spectacular in your life. Maybe he healed you. Maybe he brought you through a financial circumstance and you just thought, man, I'm never gonna get past this. Whoa, I can't believe what God's done. Maybe it's a relational thing that is that, like worked out and you just, and you were on the verge of losing hope and you like, and you go to someone in your life that's like a spiritual leader. You come to church here and you share like God did this. And it's just like, huh. Yeah, but, you know, and then it turns into a discussion about how there's something about you that doesn't measure up. Right? Imagine that moment. And that's what's being contrasted here. And And the reason I bring this up is because that happens way too easy way too often in churches today. And with us as Christians, there's way too many moments where we miss what is most important. We miss what Jesus was doing in moments like this, right? Like like there's this trajectory that Jesus takes in these moments. And if we watch him, there are things that we see about what is most important, how to live those out. And 
But the other reality is there's moments when we get pulled into these other things because there are things that matter. And it's not that uh, all the things that they taught on the Sabbath, it's not that those were bad things. There were good things about those. It's just somehow the religious leaders miss it and they make those things, good or not, they make them into something they're not supposed to be. And it just pulls them off of what matters most because they lose sight of what it would mean to be a part of also loving this guy in some simple, tangible, caring kinds of ways. And I just, I, I, I want us to set a lens. So as we think about what we're gonna be doing on March 2nd, and for that matter, what we do throughout the year, as a church, what we do as individuals, where God pulls us in and guides us in places where we get to love on people and do some beautiful and wonderful things. I don't want us to miss having a kind of lens that sees people because that's what Jesus saw. Jesus saw a man that was saying, I don't have anybody. And there were some religious leaders And I know they meant well. And I know they were sincere. And I know they wanted to hold on to what was moral and good. But they didn't see a man. They saw a mat. And what Jesus was saying, that man, he's what matters, not the mat. See? And I don't want us to be the kind of church that waits on people to get it right. I don't want us to be the kind of church that waits until people get their life pulled together, that they get their relationships pulled together, that they get all the things that, and they may be good things, but I don't want us to be the kind of church that has eyes for mats and and issues and whether they're moral or theological or, or whatever they are. I want us to have eyes for people. And the reason I say that is because those are the kinds of eyes that Jesus had. And when it comes to like um, what we want to do as a church and how we reach out, how we connect, how we touch people around us, like Jesus is the guide that we look to in understanding what it means to be able to do that. I want us to be the church that sees people and walks with them. Why? Because Jesus loved people, period. See? When that becomes your lens, like it, it just changes things. It gives you a, a perspective. You begin to see people in a new way. And as we go into March 2nd, I want to go through, I'm going to go through a, an exercise here for a few moments because I think um, we're going to be loving on people uh, that for many of the, the different places and ministries that we're going to be working with, we're going to be loving on people that are going to have struggles, especially in financial ways, Right? Whatever the the secondary struggle is, part of it, uh, it, it, there's going to be a financial component to to it that has them in straits. And sometimes that can mess with us a little bit in in seeing things well. So I want to go through um, a little financial thing here. Um, I actually want to create a budget. Um, you know, when my kids uh, were growing up and as they were, you know, becoming young adults and, um, had a little bit more money themselves, uh, you know, I was always like, you got to have a budget. You got to have a budget. And, and actually in college for both my kids, I helped them walk through a budget and everything because there, right, there's this part of it. If you just have a good budget, live within your means, like you'll be good. Um, but I want to give us a little bit of perspective here. So as we think about a budget here, um, I, want, I want you to keep in mind Just maybe people we don't often see. Um, And I also say this knowing there may be some of you in this room that are saying, "I'm boy, I'm right in that struggle. You know, if you look at the U.S. Census Department, um, currently what they would say is like when they draw the poverty line, when you hear things like people living above or below poverty or whatever, right now uh, for a family of four, and there's so many different ways to look at this, uh, but a family of four. So I, w- I want you to think about a family of four. What they would say is um, just under 20, I forgot what the, the precise figure is, but just under $2,500 a month 
would put you barely above the, what the U.S. Census Bureau would say is the poverty uh, level. So uh, just thinking in terms of like 30,000 a, a year, okay? So you think about, um, think about someone making right at that, okay? And it's like, okay, how, how do we make ends meet in this? And the first thing you've got to think about if you're in that situation is like rent, because chances are, if you're making $2,500 a month, you, like, you can't save for or make a house payment in this moment. You're, like, you, to live, you've got to have uh, some sort of rent payment. And currently, right now in Tucson, the greater Tucson area, um, the average rent for an apartment is about $1,300. Um, and for renting a house, the average payment is just under $2,000 uh, a month. But if you were to say a family of four um, and they got uh, an apartment on the lower end of things, right, that would still work for a family of four, you might be able to get away with about $1,100 um, a month uh, on there. And that's, that's for rent. And there's not a lot of apartments for a family of four at that rate, but it's uh, very possible. Uh, the next thing you got to think about in your budget, right, is utilities. And uh, talking with my staff uh, that actually work with these different ministries and all these things, uh, you know, I was trying to get an idea from them. And they said, and I thought this was a low number, but I'm going to go with their number. They said, you know, Glenn, it's possible we've got families uh, that are doing utilities for like $200 uh, a month. Um, the thing that isn't accounted in uh, that is like for sell. And, and all of the stats that you see when they look at utilities now, they take like cell phones out of that. They make it its own category. And on average right now in the greater Tucson area, a family of four spending about $150 uh, for phones for uh, everyone in the family. Um, then the other thing you have to think about, right, is like food or groceries. And the Census Bureau says uh, on the lower end of things, we spend family, a family of four is going to spend about $270 per person per month, which comes out to like $1,080. Now, those of you who are much better at math than me, like you're looking at this and you're going, there's, we got a problem, right? Right? There, there's, a, there's a math struggle here because you end up with something right in the neighborhood of 25, 30. And it's like, man, like, how do you get that to work? And right, this is working off of not just national stats. This is, where, this is Tucson, greater Tucson, Marana, Vale, Oral Valley. Um, and some of you'd be going, Glenn, but you're leaving out some things on this as well. In fact, some of my staff talked, and I didn't realize this. They said, you know, if you're raising a family today and they're, if you've got kids going to school, they have to have internet to be able to do some of the most basic homework for class. If, if they're gonna be able to learn and participate, they've gotta have uh, internet. And so all of a sudden, like, if you've got kids, you've gotta add in internet. And I'm gonna just throw in like $70 there because I think that's about what I, we pay, maybe more, maybe less. Um, but on top of that, Here's the other thing, right? How are you getting to work? How are you, like, it, like, what do you do for, like, automotive or car? And we looked at a number of different numbers, and, I, and I'm going to just say to really, like, if someone is really working hard to make this work, what if they could get that cost down to, like, $400 a month, right? And in today's world, that's not much of a car payment. It's hard to save up for much of a car, you know, at $400 a month, especially when, you know, a car that you would get for that is you're going to be using hundreds of dollars for repairs on a regular basis for that car, right? Um, and then the other one, if it's a family with kids, um, chances are in this situation, you either have a single parent family or you have a family where uh, two parents are both needing to work or trying to work and suddenly childcare becomes a major part of it. And right now in Tucson, that averages out to $812 a 
a month in there. So now all of a sudden we're looking at a cost of over $3,800 a month. And like, there's the budget. Where do you cut, right? You're, you're looking at this and it's like, um, you know, you, you've got to be making, you know, closer to like 47, that's a seven, 47,800 or something in there, right? Um, how do you make that work? And there's families that struggle uh, with this, right? And there's things where like on the childcare side, like we've got families that are making decisions where a parent is only working nights because they can't afford childcare. And so when their older child or one of their older children come home from school, it's that kid's job to watch the younger kids so a parent can go to work. They're making those kinds of decisions. Or they're gonna live on less because both parents can't work. They, they, it just, it, it's not working. They struggle with that. Um, it, and you, do you feel like, like they're working it, but it's, it's hard to get it to work. One more thing on this. So in Tucson, greater Tucson area, of all of the adult, of, of, of our entire population, it is 14.9% of our total population that are living on less than $2,500 a month today. The stat that hit me even more was when it comes to kids, 18 and under, or um, excuse me, under 18, 17 or younger, it is 19.8% of our kids. That is a, I, like, I just, I can't hardly get my mind around that. That a fifth of all the kids in the Tucson, greater Tucson area are a part of a family or on their own. It's one of the reasons why we've partnered with youth on their own, are living below the poverty line in this. That like, and I do this exercise just because I want us to see people, right? The, the, this isn't just a percentage that's people. But now let me say this too, and this is really important to me. I do not want one person here to feel shame or guilt over this. I, I don't want you to look, if you're at a place and you're like, oh my gosh, Glenn, I'm kind of in that category. I don't want you to feel shame or guilt over that at all. Some of you are like, man, I, like what I make is so much greater than that. You know what? I don't want you to be motivated in any way by a sense of guilt or shame in this moment. I'm not doing this to try and motivate us to go do something in this city out of guilt. That is, if you're feeling that, please, like, like lean back and take a breath. And, and here's why I say this. Jesus never tried to motivate people out of guilt or shame. That is, that is one of the things I love about Jesus is that I get to work on my life. I get, right? I get to think about that. I get to be challenged to grow as a human being, not because he causes me to look at myself with shame. And so I don't want to create shame for any of you. So let's just make this a free, a shame-free zone right now, okay? Anyhow, I say that with a lot of passion because um, I want us to go love on this city in a way that just comes from the, the, the gravitational pull of Jesus Christ. The more we think about how Jesus Christ saw people and the way he thinks about us and the way he just sees people, I want us to be enamored with who he was as a human being. And I want the gravitational pull of that to cause us to go, hey, there's somebody working and, they, and they're just struggling to get it to work. It just feels like they're trying to juggle and hold all of these things in life and as, and as something falls and they're just like, okay, I, I can pick that up and something else falls. I want us to just say, wow, how, how can I come along? Like my friend John came along and just said, can I help you? And just helped me pick up a few things and it made all the difference in the world, right? That, that what if that becomes like the motive in the uh, 
opportunity for all of us uh, in this. So as we think about this, that's where, that's where we come from in this. And you know, the other beautiful thing, let me tell you the other beautiful thing that I love about this. I think about these two numbers and I'm like, yeah, I don't like that. But you know what? Those numbers could be so much worse if it weren't for a lot of people, a lot of ministries and a lot of agencies in our city that are loving people already. There are groups that um, when there are kids in a home with no internet service and trying to go to school and they're in a financial bind, they go in and they help set up internet for for that family so that they take that burden off. There are ministries here in town and agencies that will come in and help parents with childcare so that they can work a job and make uh, ends meet uh, in things. There are ministries uh, that help take uh, um, uh, help people uh, pay for rent when it just like when they can't they can't get there. They're helping with those things, and they are making a profound impact in those numbers. And what we want to do, because everything's about relationships for us, right? Is how do we come along with them in a relational way to do something with this city that just pulls it together? But it's coming from a place of Christ's heart. Because as you think about this, right? There's this thing that I always think about when it comes to who we will be as a church and where we go and what we choose to do and how we choose to spend our money. Jesus is our North Star, friends. He is always our North Star. Everything we do at this place, Jesus is our North Star. And so when we go to do something like this, it's the same thing. And I, and I, I want you to feel that. I want us, I want that the beauty of who Christ is to impact the people that are struggling in this. I want it to impact the people that are struggling to help those that are struggling uh, in that, right? There's a beautiful opportunity that we have in all of this. Um, And again, uh, I walk through this because there's this thing that we see in Christ that Jesus saw people with understanding. In fact, um, if you look back at John, look back at uh, John chapter five. Look at John chapter five, uh, starting in verse five. It says this, right? The one who was there, uh, who had been an invalid for 38 years, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time. Stop right there. I love that John chooses to say, you know, Jesus is walking along and he, thank you guys, uh, Jesus learns, comes to understand. Some of you may have that translation in your Bible. Like he sees this guy, right? Like there, like, and sometimes it messes with our theology. It's like Jesus, like he's God and he's all knowing. And, and yet there was something he had to learn or, or understand. So yeah, don't, don't get messed up on the theology of this. What John is trying to do is help us understand the heart of Jesus. He was open. He looked at people with understanding. And it's like, here's this guy. And he's been working this for 38 years. He's been trying. How do I come alongside this guy and love on him in a way that'll make a difference, right? That's the beauty of it. And so for us, that's it. How do we just love on people that just where we we choose to see them with understanding. We're not sitting back saying, okay, how do you measure up? Do you, you you know, does your, is your character deserving of our love and our benefit? No, it's just like, you're a person and and we want to understand you and come along and do something that will make a difference in your life. I remember uh, when Angie and I were first married, hadn't even been married a year. I got a job at a church in Chicago. I was so excited about it. Um, I sold uh, my Jeep, uh, Angie, because Angie had a car that was way better than my Jeep. My Jeep didn't even have doors. And we thought, let's not take a car with no doors to Chicago. So we move up to Chicago. Um, The cost of living in Chicago is a little higher than Tucson. Yeah. And uh, I get there and I don't know, the second or third week, we sign a lease contract with uh, an apartment on the lower end of things. We, we actually found a, a, one of the cheapest apartments, uh, apartments that we could get. And then when I saw what my sal- my annual salary was going to uh, actually be like after taxes or whatever, kid you not, within dollars, within a few dollars, 
my annual salary equaled our annual lease payment. And Angie and I are like, we got a math problem. <laughs> there's, like, there's some other things we've got to do. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, Angie's like, okay, I'm going to go get a job. And she gets a job. But, you know, we sold one of our cars. So I, when we're down to one car and our jobs, you know, like in opposite directions. And there's this little, like, how do we pay for food? And how do we, like, all these things. And, you know, the church we worked at, there were people at that church that donated cars. And the church saw us. It's like, hey, need a car? And they gave us a car. It's just like, oh, my gosh. And there were other people. There were people in my ministry area. They were like, we will make sure that you always have groceries. There were people living in Arizona that knew that we were newlyweds and trying to start ministry and off in there. And they made sure that there was never a moment that a utility bill never got paid. And it's just, they just loved on us. And there's this beautiful thing that Jesus does when he just sees people and says, hey, I can love you in a simple, tangible, caring way. And it's just like the effect just ripples through a life in ways that we rarely understand or see. And that's the gravitational pull that wants to pull us in. That's the thing that I want us, that's the lens for how I want us to see all of this. Now, let, let me talk just a little bit here about some of the opportunities. I'm gonna just take a moment to, to, to talk about this because um, if, you, if you haven't signed up for something, I wanna encourage you, before the day's over, sign up to participate um, on March uh, 2nd. Uh, because there's some beautiful things uh, that you can do. Let, let, let me go through just a few of them. Um, we, uh, we're going to be working with the Marana Food Bank. Um, there are only 18 slots uh, left at this point. Um, and you're going to be helping to make these uh, lunches. But here's the thing I love about the Marana Food Bank is they understand that there's a population. Um, they work with people in, in, in the rural part of our community that are struggling and they have such different struggles. Oftentimes they are working really long hours, but struggling in some unique financial ways in this. And it's so beautiful to have a, you know, a ministry that says we see them and we're going to help uh, them uh, out. Uh, Primavera, which is now full, uh, but they work uh, t- with homeless uh, people and what I love about them is it's not just like okay what do we need to do to, to to just give you money to help you get a home like which is beautiful and wonderful but they are so good at helping people understand the root causes that are keeping them from being able to move towards a home and giving people a sense of hope and a, and a plan to say my goodness I can actually work toward that and so they are building people up. Um, moving them uh, towards actually having their own uh, home. Uh, Gap Ministries, which I love here in Tucson and has been doing a lot. And it is, uh, I was just told before I started, before I came out, it is uh, now full. But the Gap Ministry, which is essentially at some level like a foster ministry. But what I love about Gap Ministry is it's not just about fostering kids. They do so much to help parents, they, right? They see parents struggling that may lose their kids into the foster system. And while they're trying to take care of those kids in, in what they're doing, they are working to help those parents know how to parent better, how to get back on their feet. In fact, they have a, a remarkable program where they teach career training for automotive and for uh, like being a chef this whole program where if there's a parent that's struggling to, to, to be able to make enough money and they're like, we will train you. We'll help you get back up on your feet. They do parenting classes and all of these uh, different things and they do it with the heart of Christ, right? Christ is at the center of the Gap uh, ministry. Uh, ICS, which um, only has eight slots left and we uh, do a lot of work with uh, ICS. I think you'll be working in their uh, warehouse. And again, they do this beautiful thing uh, where they're teaching people all of these skills while providing uh, for them. They have a fantastic uh, food kitchen. Um, Habitat for Humanity, which has... Latest uh, number here, 53 openings. I'm gonna be going to Habitat for Humanity. I'm really excited because it's a chance to get out of the office and swing a hammer, right? Or use a saw. So if you know how to swing a hammer, 
or, or just know how to swim. Come and be a part of it. And, and just be a part of building something that you know is going to have a tangible effect on somebody's uh, life. Uh, Habitat for Humanity, they do so much to come alongside these folks. They even teach them about home repair and all of these other things that, that just help them own this home, right? In fact, they have to do, I think it's 250 hours of service on their own home as a part of this so that they're vested uh, in all of this. Uh, I think about the Ronald McDonald house that serves uh, families when their kids are, you know, in the hospital and struggling. Um, That one is full. TRM, uh, which is, um, uh, deals uh, with, um, and my brain just, I think, um, refugees, Thank you, whoever said it, yes. Tucson Refugee Ministry. Um, They are changing lives at such a deep level. It's not just the refugees that they're uh, working with and making a difference with. They've built a community center in the heart of Tucson in a neighborhood uh, where it's one of the neighborhoods that struggles the most with all of this. And they have created a coffee shop. They teach English. They, they teach, uh, they do all of this uh, skill uh, training. They've created a community center that has brought a fractured, you know, what normally, when you normally think of a neighborhood like that, you would think of like they get fractured and everyone's, like, they have brought this neighborhood together in such a beautiful way. It sits between all of these different schools. It has become a safe haven to the point that Um, They don't even have to worry about vandalism or theft because the people in the neighborhood protect that community center. And you know why? Because TRM as a ministry has just loved on that community. They've they've said, we see you and we don't look down on you. We don't, we, we just care. And it's amazing what happens when people feel seen and they feel like they've got somebody, right? So if you want to go and be a part of that, um, I think about the bike ministry uh, that'll be related to this. You know, earlier when I was talking about, you know, you're trying to work through your budget and it's just like, man, there's not, well, there's not $400 in the budget uh, for a car or, you know, and so we're going to have to walk to work. And you think about how that limits the possibilities. Part of what this bike ministry is doing is building bikes for adults that will use that bike because it extends the range at which they now are open to getting employment. And some of them are using that bike so that they can get a job to work that job to someday maybe, you know, get a vehicle and then they can just ride their bike for fun. But for now, that bike becomes their way to their job. And I just think of all of these things uh, that are happening in all of this. Be a part of it. Be a part of it because there is something in your heart that is being pulled toward it. Because it's the gravitational pull of Jesus Christ. And the more you see him, and the more you understand how he saw people and loved people and wanted to make a difference, that you just find your heart wanting to do the same thing. Sign up for something. Be a part of it. Um, I want us to end our time a little differently here. I'm, I'm, the worship team's gonna come out here. And I want us to, like, when you think about what Jesus was doing, he's wanting to build a different kind of kingdom, right? He's wanting to build a kingdom where love reigns, where, right, where there's a difference that's being made. And the worship team's gonna come out and lead us through this song. And there's this video that comes as a part of it. And I want you to just let this be an anthem to what God is doing within and through us as a church and how we wanna build a kingdom that reflects the kingdom that Jesus is wanting to build. And then I'll come back out and close this.
To come and help, it opens up the door for God to, to do something special. And it's um, is as much giving as often what you receive in this world. Yeah. Yeah, so there's just so many amazing stories here at Gap. But one that really sticks out uh, and is really just awesome to share is we had a, uh, a young lady who went through our group home care, found the Lord, went home, introduced her parents to God. They realized that they needed more of God and needed to change their lives even more, checked themselves in a teen challenge, got their lives right, and now he rents one of our facilities and is an auto mechanic here, right here on the campus of Hope. And it's just such amazing opportunity to see how God orchestrates sometimes when you don't realize that you're making an impact on just a small a small life, that it really makes a big change in the whole, whole, whole community. Oh, we're getting to know refugee families and um becoming friends with some people that have come from other countries has been such an amazing experience for me. You know, it's good to get the feeling that you're helping a broad community, but knowing that everything that you're doing is helping a specific person and changing their life because of what you've done and how important that is. Um, it's changed my, my thinking. It has changed my heart, I think, and it's given me some opportunities to share God's love with people. Um, when you sit with someone and, you know, you're making eye, eye contact and smiling and you realize you have a lot of it. Some people need a bike for transportation, and that transportation takes them to, to a job that helps them provide for a family. On March 2nd, we'll be assembling bikes for Tucson Refugee Ministry providing bikes for those people that need that mobility. Today we went out and picked up the dress because 
of the invasive species to the Sonoran Desert and to Saguaros. It's helped me um, go down a little bit and sit, have a cup of tea. I don't know. It's really, it has changed my life. Your kingdom is backwards. It flows in reverse. Will you call a treasure? This world calls a curse. The small become great and the last become first. Your kingdom is backwards. Lord, teach us to serve. As it is with your kingdom, let it be with your church. Okay, before, before I send you off, um, real quick here. If you haven't signed up for one, I encourage you to do so. If you've got questions about it or want to talk to some of our wonderful folks right over here, we can tell you all about uh, March 2nd, and they can even help you sign up on your phone. Um, invite someone maybe who doesn't even go to Casas. What a great way to be introduced to Casas is to go and serve alongside a bunch of other people here at Casas. If you're new this morning, visiting or a guest or whatever, I'm gonna be right over here and I would love just to meet you, shake your hand to this morning. May you be blessed and may God shine his face and his love on you and all your family. Amen. Have a great morning. See you next Sunday.